Well, with the death of Queen Elizabeth of England this past week, with the ascension of her son Charles to the throne of England, I wonder just how often people lay claim to being members of the royal family. I, I don't know if that's a thing, but I would imagine there are people out there who claim to be the true heir to the throne of England, that they actually descend from the proper lineage and have greater claim to the throne than what Charles does. I, I would imagine that probably happens with some regularity, and I'm guessing those claims go nowhere, are probably not even heard outside of the family circles of those making the claim, just that crazy uncle spouting off his conspiracy theories of how his ancestors were maliciously carved out of the royal family tree, denying them their right to be king. And for any claim that does make it to court, well, I suppose lawyers for the royal family produce documentation tracing the family line back generations over hundreds and hundreds of years, demonstrating that, yes, Charles is the legitimate heir to the throne. Now, I would imagine for most of us, our family genealogies are not so significant. I'm guessing none of our jobs depend upon who our ancestors are. I guess that, well, I guess maybe unless you uh, had to get some kind of high security clearance that required listing who your parents were and their affiliations and that sort of thing. But other than that, in general, I'm guessing your genealogy really doesn't matter in any legal sense. Because genealogies are not as significant today for many of us, it's probably a big reason why we might be tempted to skim past the genealogies that we encounter in Matthew and even in the Gospel of Luke. Sure, they're great for people who are curious about such things, but genealogies, even the genealogy of Jesus, really isn't that important to our faith, to our walk with Jesus, right? Well, if that kind of describes you, if that describes your approach to the genealogies of Christ, just to rush right past them to get to the real action of Jesus' life, I hope today that you will reconsider. Today we are starting a series called, as I shared, The Company He Keeps. We're going to look at various encounters that Jesus has with different people throughout, specifically, the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to look at what those encounters reveal to us about the kind of people who are most likely to find a home in the kingdom of God. But we're going to start the series in Matthew 1 with a genealogy. Jesus doesn't even appear on the scene until the last verse of chapter 1. Instead, most of the chapter, 17 verses, are nothing but a genealogy. Now, the genealogy of Jesus is significant for several reasons, including demonstrating that Jesus himself does descend from the proper lineage required of the promised Messiah. Now, most ancient genealogies would deliberately focus on those individuals in the family tree who could best boost the credentials of the one laying claim to whatever title or inheritance they sought. And you would expect the same for this genealogy that Matthew presents of Jesus. I mean, if Matthew is trying to bolster the claim that Jesus meets all the requirements for the Messiah then you would expect that in this genealogy he would focus on those individuals in his family tree who would best bolster Christ's claim to be the Messiah. And Matthew does. Kind of. Now this is not an exhaustive genealogy. Matthew does not list every ancestor all the way back to Abraham, the 
the father of the Jews, no, for editorial reasons, he highlights only certain people in Jesus' family tree. So you would think that in limiting himself to only a few of the names in Jesus' family tree, he would highlight those names who would best silence the skeptics and the critics of Jesus' claim to be Messiah. But that's not what Matthew does. Instead, he sprinkles in the names, for example, of several women. And in the world of ancient genealogies, that's a problem. Most genealogies in the ancient world did not include women. And it's not just that Matthew includes the names of some of the women in Jesus' family tree. It's the women he does include. Not the Eves and the Sarahs, no. The women he includes, as one writer describes, are mostly poor, mostly misfits, widows, unimportant, unknown, even sinful women. So why these women? Well, maybe it's because in these women... Through the inclusion of these particular women, Matthew is preparing us for the new kind of kingdom that God's Messiah, King Jesus, is bringing into this world. Royalty, as we will discover, in God's family is not for those with the purest bloodlines or for those of the best pedigrees. No, royalty is in King Jesus' kingdom is often for the ones least likely to ever be confused with royalty in the kingdom of this world. And maybe you feel like that would describe you, that nobody would mistake you for royalty. The branches of Jesus' family tree aren't all so straight and mighty. They're often broken very craggly. And as we look at the kinds of broken branches that are scattered throughout Jesus' family tree, you may find yourself very encouraged, and I hope so. Or you may find yourself disturbed. And maybe that's needed right now in your life. Because that's what the crooked branches of Jesus' family tree will do. They will either encourage you or disturb you. And so we're just going to look at a few of these branches today. The crooked branches that fill Jesus' family tree are often the powerless, not the powerful. You can read in detail about the first woman that Matthew presents, Tamar. You can read her story in Genesis chapter 38, the first book of the Bible. I'm just going to give you some of the highlights of Tamar's life, and they're not pretty. In an attempt to blackmail her father-in-law, Tamar dresses up as a prostitute, seduces her father-in-law, and conceives a child by him. Who says the Bible is boring, right? It's pretty racy stuff. Now, why is a person like that given any mention in Jesus' family tree? That's the kind of person whose story you want to keep hid in the closet. That's a scandal to bury out of sight. And yet, here she is. What is Matthew trying to tell us? Well, maybe Matthew includes her because there's more to her story than just tabloid fodder, like the fact that her first husband was a wicked man, so wicked that he incurs God's wrath and is put to death. And because she has no children by her first husband, she is given in marriage, per the custom of the time, to his younger brother so that she might bear children and keep her first husband's legacy alive. That brother turns out not to be a winner either. In fact, he's so wicked, he's also incurs the wrath of God, and God strikes him dead. Now, now there is another brother, but he's very young. He's still a child at this time. So her her father-in-law promises that when the boy is of age, he will be given in marriage to her. So in the meantime, Tamar returns to her father's home, and she waits. She waits because marriage and the children who will result from that marriage 
are her only means of provision in her life, especially as she gets older. Because apart from children who can take care of her in her old age, she will be doomed to poverty. Life was very precarious for women in the ancient world. And Tamar is powerless. She is completely dependent upon the integrity of her father-in-law to do the right thing, to do what he says he will do. And she has no other option. She can't get married because she is legally bound to wait for this child to grow up and become a man of Marian age. But her father-in-law does not keep his word. His boy grows up, and instead of fulfilling his promise to Tamar, her father-in-law does nothing. There is no wedding. Tamar's flickering light of hope is snuffed out. She is of an age by this point where even if she is released from that legal bond, not many are going to be looking to get married to a woman of her age. She's desperate. Her father-in-law's injustice against her crushes her. There is nothing that she can do to right this wrong, and that's when she hatches this plan to blackmail her father-in-law. Now, what she does isn't right. That's not the lesson that we're to take from this. Oh, I can blackmail people when they do me wrong. This is great. Let me take some notes. That is not what I want you to take away from this, okay? So let me make that very clear. But what's been done to her by the one who is in power over her is worse than anything that she does in her powerless position. Her inclusion in Jesus' family tree tells us something about the kind of people Jesus came for. And it's not the powerful. He came for the powerless. God blesses those people who depend only on him. They belong to the kingdom of God. Now eventually, if you know the story, her father-in-law does come clean. He owns up to it. He admits that her righteousness is greater than his own. And because of her, the genealogy of the coming Messiah continues. From the next woman included in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus shows that the kingdom of God is for the broken and not the unrepentant. Next in the family tree, and hundreds of years after Tamar, we encounter Rahab. We read about her in the Old Testament book of Joshua, chapter 2. What do we know about her? Well, while Tamar pretended to be a prostitute, Rahab, Rahab really is a prostitute. She's also a traitor, at least from the perspective of her fellow citizens in the Canaanite city of Jericho. Jericho is the first of the Canaanite city, cities that the people of Israel overcome as they enter into and conquer the promised land that God had given them. Besides fulfilling his promise to his people to provide a land of their own, God is also using the Israelites as his instruments of judgment against the wickedness of the people of Canaan. They were so wicked they were even in, engaging in things like child sacrifice. Well, before the Israelites go into Jericho, they send in a couple of spies to do some recon work. By this point, the citizens of Jericho, they've heard some of the stories. Rahab has heard some things about God's people. And more so, she and the other people of Jericho have heard some things about Israel's God. And what they're hearing about the God of Israel is striking heart, uh, fear in their hearts, including it appears in the heart of Rahab. And so when the spies seek out shelter in her residence, she doesn't turn them away. Instead, she aids and abets them, saying, I know that the Lord has given Israel this land. Everyone shakes with fear because of you. We heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea so you could leave Egypt. And we heard how you destroyed Sihon and Og, those two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River. We know that the Lord your God rules heaven and earth, and we've lost our courage and our will to fight. Please promise me in the Lord's name that you will be as kind to my family as I have been to you. When Rahab was confronted 
with the knowledge of the acts of God as demonstrated through his people. She puts her faith in God. She's a wise woman. Now, Rahab is not mentioned in Jesus' family tree because she was of upright, good, moral character. She wasn't. She's there because when she encountered the holy God, she is convicted. She is convicted by God's power. She is convicted by God's holiness. And in light of that, she is convicted of her own brokenness. Perhaps she somehow intuitively understood that the wrath that was coming against her people was deserved. But instead of hardening her heart to that conviction, she throws herself on God's mercy. Please promise me in the Lord's name that you will be as kind to my family as I have been to you. Her story suggests something to us about the kind of people who are welcomed into God's kingdom. God blesses those who grieve. They will find comfort. Talking about those who grieve their sin, whose hearts are broken by their sin, they are the ones who will find comfort in the arms of a gracious God because the sacrifice he desires is a broken heart. He will not reject a broken and repentant heart. Rahab will later marry into the Israelite people, become the great-grandmother of King David, her daughter-in-law, Ruth, is also included in Matthew's, in Matthew's genealogy. And her inclusion hints at something else about the kind of people the kingdom of God is for. It is for the seeking, not the satisfied. It's for the seeking, not the satisfied. Ruth is another crooked branch in Jesus' family tree. We read about her in the book by her name, the book of Ruth. And like Rahab was an outsider, she too is an outsider. She's not an Israelite. She's not one of God's people when we first meet her. She and her people, the Moabites, are perennial enemies of the people of God. And yet, during a time of famine in Israel, an, Israel, an Israelite family gets desperate, and they go to the land of Moab to seek out a better life, at least a survivable life. And the two sons of this family marry two women of Moab. One of those two women is Ruth. Well, the men of this Israelite family, they all die, leaving Ruth, her sister-in-law, and her mother-in-law all widows. The mother-in-law decides to go back to Israel, back to her people, and Ruth pleads to go with her. Her mother-in-law objects, go back to your own people, she tells her. But Ruth persuades her, saying, don't urge me to leave you to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Ruth could have stayed in Moab. And really, that would make more sense. Why? Because those are her people. Her family is in Moab. She knows the culture. She is accepted there. She has a greater likelihood of being taken care of there than with a people who are often closed to outsiders. And yet, what does she do? She puts her hope in the God of Israel rather than in the comforts of the world that she knows. God blesses those people who are humble. The earth will belong to them. God blesses those people who want to obey him more than to eat or drink. They will be given what they want. By following the God of her mother-in-law, Ruth finds her way into God's story of redeeming his creation. The next woman we encounter in Matthew's geneal genealogy shows us another hint of who the kingdom of God is for. It is for the used, not for the users. Now, some may question if Bathsheba should be considered in the same company as Tamar and Rahab and Ruth. After all, when we understand the context of their stories, they seem to be more easy to sympathize with than Bathsheba is. Bathsheba, unlike the others, is a temptress, 
right? Doesn't she use her sexuality to seduce King David? To lead him astray? Isn't she at least a, in part a co-conspirator in David's plot to murder her husband Uriah the Hittite so as to cover up their act of adultery? You know, the way she's often portrayed in the many retellings of her story in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it's easy to see why so many view Bathsheba as a villain and not as a victim. And yet there's good reason to see that she really is more of a victim than a villain in this story. David is the king of Israel. He is the most powerful man in the nation, in that region. He's already married. Actually, he has several wives at this point. None of what happens to Bathsheba would have even happened had David been where he was supposed to be when the events of 2 Samuel 11 unfold. He shouldn't have been in Jerusalem. He should not have been in his palace. He should not have been on the roof of that palace, taking in the evening air and whatever views the roof offered him, one of which was a direct line of sight into an outdoor bath featuring Bathsheba. He shouldn't have been there. He should have been out with his army fighting for the people. Well, you might ask, what was Bathsheba doing taking a bath outside in view of the king? That's a good question. And it's possible she may have intentionally put herself in a place where she might be seen by the king. But when you get into the background of the customs of the time, there's also some legitimate reasons for why she might have been taking a bath outside. And when you consider all the things that would have had to fall into place in order for her to be seen by David and for him to react, react as he did, that's a, that's, a, that's a stretch to think that she had thought through all of that. Regardless, David is not where he's supposed to be. As king, he is to be the protector of his people. But instead of a protector, he has now become a predator. Instead of praying for his people, he's now preying upon his people. And so he sends for Bathsheba to be brought to him. Now, King David most likely thought this would be a one-night stand. Nobody's going to find out, least of all Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, who is where he's supposed to be. He's out fighting with Israel's army, the one that David should have been leading into battle. But instead of a one-night stand, instead of satisfying his lust with what's-her-name and then moving on as if nothing happened, What's her name follows up with a three worded message to David I am pregnant. Isn't that how sin so often unfolds? What seems so simple and easy to get away with turns into something else. David gets desperate. He schemes to bring Uriah back from the battle under the guise of getting an update on how the battle is going. But really, he's hoping that Uriah will spend the night in Jerusalem with his wife and then he can be considered the father of the baby. But Uriah, turns out, is too honorable, much more honorable than the king. He refuses to enjoy any of the comforts that are being denied his men who are where they are supposed to be. Finally, in order to cover it all up, David arranges to have Uriah basically murdered. Maybe that's why in Jesus' family tree in Matthew, Bathsheba is referred to not by name, but by her husband's name, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now that absence of her name is not to shame Bathsheba, but to remind the reader of David's sin. David, King David, used Bathsheba to satisfy his lust. He used her husband to protect his image. In his sin, in his hardness of heart, David does not see people as God sees them, as his creation, as his image bears. Instead, to King David, other people are just merely a means to an end, to his ends. The inclusion of Bathsheba in Jesus' family tree provides us another hint of who God welcomes into his kingdom. 
God blesses those who are merciful. They will be treated with mercy. What is it to be merciful? To be merciful is to remember the worth of other people. No matter who they are, no matter what they can or cannot do for you, you treat them with compassion. You treat them with mercy. You treat them as those made in the image of God because they are. David doesn't do that for Bathsheba or for Uriah. Users are not the kind of people the kingdom of God is for. And yet, let's not forget, <laughs> David obviously is in Jesus' family tree. How is that possible? Because the mercy he denies Bathsheba and Uriah is mercy that is shown to him. When he is held to account, David repents. He is broken. And he cries out, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. There are severe consequences for David's sin. But God does show him mercy, including providing a son, Solomon, born to him and Bathsheba after the death of their first child, and the line to Jesus continues. And it is this Jesus who will remove the stain of David's sin, but not just his sin. He will remove the stain of all of our sin through his death on the cross. You see, the royalty of King Jesus is not dependent upon those who came before him. No, their royalty and our royalty depends upon Jesus, upon what he accomplished in his death and in his resurrection. He makes us royalty. Not our bloodlines, not our pedigrees, not our accomplishment. Christ alone. You know, unlike others who look for validation, who look for their identity, even redemption through somebody in their family tree, Jesus is the one who does all that and so much more for those grafted into his family tree, including the overlooked rather than the celebrated. Mary is a poor, young, peasant girl. She's not royalty. Nobody ever clamors to take Mary's picture. And yet, in her obscurity, somebody notices her. Somebody takes note of her. It's because nothing escapes the notice of God, especially one who is humble before him, faithfully honoring him in whatever they do whether anybody notices or not. God blesses those people whose hearts are pure. They will see him. We often get so caught up in the celebrities among us, but it's the one who humbly delights in God, who finds favor with God. You know, the hints revealed by the likes of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary at who Jesus grafts into his family tree may encourage you. I hope they do. But I also recognize for some of us it may disturb us. If you're feeling like you're on the bottom and nobody cares, be encouraged. Because clearly God does care for the likes of you. If you're broken by your sin and you think you're beyond the reach of God's forgiveness. Be encouraged because in Christ, your sin is not beyond the reach of what he accomplished for you on the cross. If you're seeking, if you're seeking because you know the things of this world do not satisfy, be encouraged because you're right, they don't, not ultimately. Only God and the things of his kingdom are worth seeking. And if you if you've been used or you're feeling used by others making you feel that you are disposable, be encouraged because that's not how God sees you. In fact, Jesus died and rose again so that through him you could be brought near. You could be raised up to new life, eternal life with him. And if you're feeling overlooked, thinking that you don't matter, be encouraged because you do. In fact, God delights in lifting up the humble. 
If on the other hand, you enjoy in your life a position of power, of prestige, and privilege, and you are oblivious to the ways that you can be taken advantage of others in your spheres of influence, be disturbed because you may be blind to your humility before God. If you find yourself in your heart glad or even proud that you're not like the addict or you're not like the one in jail or you're not like the person who's made a lifetime of bad decisions, be disturbed because yours is the heart that may be far from God. If you are content with the things of this world, if you're content with your wealth, if you're content with your prestige, if you're content with your privilege, be disturbed because you may not want the things of God. And if you see others through a prism of just of what they can do for you, rather than how you can be a blessing to them, be disturbed because such are those who are outside the kingdom of God. And if it's your desire more than anything to be lifted up in the eyes of men, be disturbed because you may get what you desire. And that's it. Jesus came for everybody. But not everybody will turn to Jesus. Are you of the kind who turns to Jesus who will continue turning to Jesus find a home in his kingdom. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this is not an either or. The truth is we find ourselves on either side. Lord, we know there is pride in our hearts. We know there is lust in our hearts. We know that sometimes we do seek to take advantage of others, to use others, no matter what our situation in life is. And when we think about what awaits those who, whose hearts are far from you, it does strike fear in our hearts. Lord, we know that in our sin, we are broken. We know what it is at times to be overlooked, to be used, to be marginalized. Lord, may we, may we humble ourselves before you. May we cry out to you in mercy to receive that forgiveness that David received ultimately through your son Jesus. May we seek to find delight only in your son Jesus and in what your kingdom offers. Lord, with the help of your Holy Spirit, find us to be the kind of people who desire to find our home with you. And through Jesus, all of us can. Thank you. In his name we pray. Amen.